Hello and welcome to our video that deals with topic four. We're going to focus on Chinese political institutions. All right, so when we take a look at China, political elites definitely have control in this authoritarian regime. Um, the leadership of this regime um, is going to come out of and through uh, the Communist Party. In China, which is very special, um, are the importance of prefer, uh, personal relationships. These personal relationships bind um, these leaders together in interesting combinations through pragmatic decisions, through family, and through history. Um, the Communist Party and the Communist system revolves around the idea of a unitary system where the party is central and all-powerful. But again, the size of China in terms of its population and its um, land, sheer size in terms of land size, faces or gives this unitary system a lot of issues. All right? Economic liberalization or the change, again, of China, and again, we can kind of talk about China, the two Chinas, you know, we talk about China and Taiwan, now we can talk about China in terms of political, which is communist, and its economy, which is definitely much more market-oriented. All right, um, The par Communist Party kind of um, is all over. You can find it everywhere in Chinese society, and it penetrates at all levels. Um, and again, even with all of the changes of the last 40 years since um, Deng Xiaoping, um, the Communist Party is still the center of the Chinese political system. All right, the Communist Party is organized in a hierarchical structure. Um, you can kind of look at it from the bottom up, from the village to the county to the province to the nation. At the top of that system is the general secretary, and we can kind of view this position as the supreme leader. Um, right there with underneath the general secretary, um, you're going to have a standing committee that's made up of seven members a Politburo, which is made of 25 members, the Central Committee, which has 350 members that meets once a year um, in total, but works in smaller groups throughout the year, and then the National Party Congress, which has more than 2,000 delegates, which meets every five years, and this is a rubber stamp legislature. All right, so you can see here, we have the General Secretary, who is a member of the Standing Committee, and he is the at the pinnacle of that um, Communist Party organization. Um, again, we're talking about a small group of men that meet in secret, um, and all of the membership um, is kind of a mirror of those factions or those personal relationships um, in practice. The Chinese allow some non-communist parties to be involved in the process. They actually have created these, um, again, to try to create some sense of legitimacy. And they've created eight different democratic parties. And they draw from specific groups inside the society, businessmen, scholars, a couple different examples. These are tightly controlled. Um, by the Communist Party, and they do allow some amount of loyal non-opposition. All right, elections in China. Again, elections are used by the Communist Party to help legitimize the government and the Communist Party. They aren't free and fair elections um, in the fact that the party is going to control the election commissions, which selects the candidates and runs the elections. The only direct elections are held at the lowest village level, and they elect for people's congresses, and they also elect for village leadership. So they do have elections in China, but again, the party controls these elections very closely, and they only occur at the lowest level. All right, we talk about factions. Again, these have been part of Chinese politics all the way up until Mao's death. And again, even before Deng Xiaoping's death in 97, these factions emerged again. And we don't know a lot about the way that these factions work because they're constantly changing. And again, everything that happens behind the scenes, we really don't have any clue about. And the factions can be broken down. We had conservatives. Again, these were um, more hardline focused on maintaining and strengthening the party. They did support economic liberalization, but they've kind of lost some power from the most recent general selection of general secretary. We had the liberals who were in power um, at the time of Tiananmen Square, and they basically were removed after that. Um, they support democratic reform and more political liberty. You can see that they've definitely moved away and lost influence. We have the Shanghai Gang. These are the associates of the former leader, Jiang Zemin. And again, he was a proponent of economic liberalization, but he was a huge fan of that patron-client system and those relationships. They have a, a lot of influence today. The princelings uh, is formed or based around the aristocracy of families that have connections back to Mao, connections to the Long March. Um, Xi Jinping, the current president, has a connection there. Finally, we have the Chinese Communist Youth League, and this is the youth organization similar to the NASHI, which we looked at um, in Russia, which basically is going to promote and grow new leaders in the Communist Party, and Hu Jintao would be connected to that particular faction. All right, so the current leadership, when we take a snapshot of that, we see strong representation from both the Shanghai Gang and the Princelings. Five out of the seven members of the Standing Committee are with the Shanghai Gang, gang and two um, are from that Princelings group. 
One of the concerns here is that both of the membership of these groups is rapidly aging, and it's really going to be interesting to see where they move from here. Um, again, we don't have a great idea of how these things work, and again, it's kind of unclear. Um, they're constantly changing, they overlap. It's very fluid in terms of old and new connections and alliances, and of course, pragmatic decisions. All right, so corruption, big issue in China um, when we're talking about the Communist Party and leadership and political institutions. The people see and they know that corruption is an issue, and the system is filled with corruption. Bribes are very common, um, but the party has taken steps over the last few years in particular to try to address these. There have been several notable party members that have been removed. They've had some show trials to show the public that the party cares and they are taking action. And again, Xi Jinping, as part of his um, stepping, stepping into the presidency or the general secretary's powers, has talked about um, corruption as being the main problem in China today. So we're moving forward, or he's moving forward to address that. All right, so interest groups. Organized interest groups and any social movements are forbidden um, to really influence the process in China. And again, it'd be very difficult for them um, to influence the process the way that the Chinese state quells opposition. Um, again, the party tries to placate this by creating its own organizations in which people can express very limited views. Um, for example, the All China Federation of Trade Unions represents factory workers in China. It gives, at least gives them an outlet to have some little say that's not going to be too contradictory. Donway, and these have been around, these work groups have been around since the very beginning of communism, and they were instituted as a way to push down party policy, um, as a way of keeping an eye on the population, but also to be the, um, the conduit for jobs, income, promotions, medical care, housing. Again, this is a really cool tool of the party, and it kind of serves in, in, a, in a way as an interest group. When we're going to describe China, of course, it's going to have a state corporatist-based system. Everything is going to happen from the inside out. All right, the media in China, again, most is state-run and controlled. We've seen a growth of independent media today. Investigative reporting has been given a little bit of a leash, again, because it generally goes after corruption. So it's important for the party to show that they're, they're active. Um, they do have, um, Jiwa is the official press state news agency. Again, it's the official news. Um, all of these outlets are subject to very heavy censorship. And of course, the internet is very strictly controlled. It's the most um, aggressive firewall in the world. All right, so let's look at the institutions of government. We have a parallel system that exists here. We have the Communist Party. We have the actual state um, and government, and we have the People's Liberation Army. So we basically have three sections here. Um, basically, it creates this dual role. They're vertically separated by the next highest level of government, but then there's horizontal supervision by the Communist Party. So basically, they run um, parallel to one another. And again, they are overwatching. Um, the Communist Party is going to have the ultimate decision-making on its um, <clears throat> government neighbors, all right? And we're going to take a peek at the chart, a chart in class, which is going to make this a little clearer. And again, very similar to the Soviet Union's old system, but again, in the Soviet system, you could, there was more mobility based on, you know, your talents. Again, that exists in China, but again, who you know has a much greater role in China than in the USSR. All right, so we've got the executive branch. This is the head of state, five-year term. Um, they're limited to two terms, and they must be at least 45 years old. And this is the same for the vice president. Um, generally, the president will assume, if he's the president, he also assumes the general secretary of the Communist Party. This has happened in the last few transfers, which take place just about every 10 years. They also have a premier who's the head of government, well, like a prime minister. He is appointed by the president, a lot like Russia, and he's always a member of the standing committee. So it's not a free choice. The president has to pick someone else from that seven. The premier runs the uh, state council. He runs the bureaucracy of the country. Um, 30 million cadres. These are the power positions that work for the government, these bureaucrats. So you can see, you know, a lot. There's a huge number of people employed by the government. And the current pro uh, premier is Li Keqiang. All right, the judiciary, based around what's called the People's Court System and the People's Procurate. Um, the Procurate supplies lawyers for the system. Again, there was no rule of law in China, no history of the rule of law under Mao. Um, it is acknowledged today in China. Again, the business and market liberalization has demanded that there be some level of the rule of law and a legal reform with contracts and um, um, to, to sue, all of those business-related matters. The criminal justice system in China works very quickly and very harshly. There's a 99% conviction rate when cases go to trial. And also, China is a world leader in the use of the death penalty. 
All right, the People's Liberation Army is uh, plays a much greater role in China, even though it doesn't have a formal position in the framework. It's a huge influence. Again, it's grown alongside communism. If you go back and you look at Mao, one of Mao's most famous sayings, political power grows out of the barrel of a gun. Um, so you can see here there's a, a foundation for this um, this um, military um, influence. 2.3 million members of their military in active duty and 12 million in reserve. They spend um, considerably less than the United States. We spend about four times as much on our military as they do. All right. Um, the head of the um, Central Military Commission is another power position, and generally the president is going to serve in all three roles, president, head of party, and head of the military. Um, there was a, um, uh, a period of time where um, Jiang Zemin held on to the leadership of the military for a period of time before that was turned over um, to Hu Jintao. So again, it's not an automatic, it's just kind of the way the system works um, in that Security Council and the men at the top. All right, thanks for joining me for this discussion of political institutions in China. Make sure that you do the Google form.